First of all, I'd like to say a few words about a turbulent market. Well, what exactly is a turbulent market? And I'm going back to a model which was devised some 30 years ago by two American academics who were able to define it in terms of two dimensions, uh, static going through to dynamic, and in the other dimension, uh, simple through to complex. Uh, and those of us who've got teenage kids, I guess, wish that we were back in a static and simple world rather than the one which they inhabit these days, a turbulent environment, which is typified by being dynamic and complex. And in fact, it's difficult to imagine a static and simple world of, of teenagers and young people these days uh, until we think back to the time, or the date in fact, when the word teenager was first coined. And there was such a time when life was simpler and static because teenager was actually first coined in 1943 in America. And before that, we can think that, well, did teenagers and young people really exist in anyone's minds, uh, particularly advertisers and marketers? Were they just people really passing through from childhood into adulthood without anything in between? And in fact, it's a bit of a problem, isn't it? What, what is youth? Uh, definitions have really got very complicated because perhaps even 10, 15 years ago we'd have confidently said, well, we can define youth by age and quite typically it's 10, uh, 15 to 24. Uh, but in recent years we've seen all sorts of complexities uh, in terms of how different marketers and agencies have come to define it. And earlier on today we heard about the concept of tweenagers. Uh, the marketers in the last 10 years have defined this group maybe from even age 8 I think we've heard 10 this morning, age 8 up to about 14, uh, as marketers have, have looked beyond the teenage group down into an even younger age group. The teenagers at least are fairly self-defining, uh, because at least if your, your age ends in teen, 13 to 19, you're a teenager. Uh, and beyond that, we go into older age groups. And here we have an overlaying, and from a Western perspective, uh, very often we've used concepts like Generation Y, and before that, Generation X, which is now going out into the late 30s and early 40s. Uh, and of course, we've got, uh, got us all, we're all uh, older age groups and we're all behaving younger as well. So that adds yet a further complex dimension in terms of what actually is youth in terms of age. Well, what's going on with those teenagers then? Well, um, if they exist between about 8 and 14, they can be defined by being driven by a diet of information, and where do they get that information from? Well, in the UK at least, 71% of kids have TVs in their own rooms. Uh, some 74% of them have got access to a PC at home. And increasingly in 2000, about 10% of them have a PC in their own room. Uh, and that's rapidly increasing as well. So they're using a computer as a vehicle for, for activities and entertainment. And they're able then to access all sorts of trends set by the media in the comfort or privacy of their own room that might share it with uh, a sibling, but also from TV shared in the house, from the internet, and from a number of other sources which we'll look at, uh, and which have been referred to already by, by Bijou. And of course they are the most brand conscious generation yet, and how could they be otherwise when they've been bombarded by so many uh, sources of information about brands, uh, and uh, as a result this group has become one of the most knowledgeable, the most savvy, about brands and what they mean. But also, there's a slightly blacker side to this, a slightly greyer side, in terms of they do still need to be listened to and to understood. So, on the one hand, we have a group that seems to be very, very confident, uh, very knowledgeable, has all sorts of sources of information. On the other hand, they're coming back and saying they need to be listened to, they need to be included, they need to be understood better. Uh, I'll say a few words about teenagers, but I think in terms of lifestyle and, and attitude, we can look at Generation Y in a few seconds. But we also really note that they are a really large group, clearly much larger in India than uh, in, in the West, but in the US it's 8.5% of the total population. Uh, they are then a very affluent group, and perhaps this is a point of difference with Indian teens. Uh, parents are still uh, very important in providing uh, funding for them. And I think the breakup of, of marriages, the increase of divorce in, in the West, has actually contributed to teen spending power, and actually tween spending power, uh, as parents, divorced parents between them, vie to um, appeal and, and um, 
uh, continue to show some sort of affection in both comments to their children. They are nevertheless high spenders. Um, they're also very impressionable, um, so brand loyalty, loyalties are still in formation, uh, and they're re very receptive, as we've seen, to all sorts of new products. And I think it's very interesting for us perhaps to consider uh, whether teenagers have global characteristics and whether we can compare those to local communities. Uh, because we'll see in a minute that while on the one hand uh, we see teenagers around the world wearing Nike and Adidas and they're into Billabong t-shirts and so on and there seems to be a global dress, there, do seem to be, uh, there does seem to be with this generation a sort of sense of coming into the home, to sort of drawing back in on themselves. Part of that spiritualism that was referred to earlier, I think, is an aspect of that. Uh, fairly quickly, I don't want to list them out, but Generation Y is, uh, is a popularly used term now for the generation born between 1977 and 1994. In a way, it's a little bit of a cop-out, because when we compare it to Generation X, we can see it's a rather useful badging uh, system which contains all sorts of idiosyncrasies uh, and also some paradoxes. So various people at one point or other have said Generation Y has these characteristics. They're activists, they're out and about being uh, useful and doing useful things with pressure groups and so on. They aren't as cynical as the guys who came before. They're op more optimistic, maybe some of them more idealistic. Sounds like Indian, Indian youth. Uh, they're group-oriented. Uh, they're anti-corporate. If you remember a few years ago at the the WTO meeting in Seattle, um, and if you've read No Logo by Naomi Klein, uh, there's a whole load of anti-corporate uh, sentiment there. Uh, recently, in 2004, uh, some me project was identified by researchers uh, in the UK, uh, where kids were really sort of thought to be sort of not really engaged with any with big issues. If necessary, uh, they pull back in on themselves, and that the world outside, the big world outside, might be too difficult and too complicated to get to grips with, they weren't that concerned with it. And relationships really being defined by richness. We'll come back to this later on. The, this generation seems to be looking for rich and deep and meaningful sort of relationships and personal encounters. And briefly, we can look at the even older age group, the Generation Xs. Uh, generation X, interestingly, was originally coined in, in the 1960s. Uh, and the, the researchers then were very optimistic about the world of, of youth and thought that the, the sort of the baton was being handed on to a very worthy generation. But it all sort of got forgotten for a while and then sort of was re-launched re in the 1990s. Uh, and this generation has now felt to be sort of rather more nihilistic, uh, alienated, still is image and brand conscious, so rather superficial in that sense, pragmatic. <laughs> Interestingly, relationships here defined by the world of work. The younger generation, generation wise, defined by more personal relationships, Generation X looking really to define their world around work. Work's really important for them. Their jobs, it gives them status and their position. Generation Y don't seem to be so concerned. There is a further dimension we can think about uh, young people, uh, and indeed older people, and that's all to do with tribes. Uh, and this is rather a sort of postmodern concept, a, a sort of concept that's developed over the last 15 years. It's really quite useful though. Because the researchers here are saying, well, actually, forget Western-style segmentation and complicated um, age and attitudinal surveys and so on. Let's look at the way that people actually seem to share the same passions and values. Uh, but what's actually happening is, is this tribal stuff. Tribes are really quite unstable. They're small-scale. They're effectual. It's all to do with liking each other. And here we've got these shared emotions, lifestyles. These are things that hold them together, moral beliefs and senses of injustice. But not only, this is the big difference, I think, between traditional segmentation uh, and uh, otherwise, uh, and tribal segmentation, if you like, or tribalism, you can belong to several groups simultaneously. So you can, you can have an online personality uh, and join in a group online. You're the Man United supporter. And then you can be, have a different tribe. You can go out in the evening and you're a club. You're part of the clubbing world. And so there's a, there's a distinction here, really, between being a single person and having multiple allegiances and alliances. And all this could be described really as sort of we're in the middle of the winds of change. There's a sort of erosion of the old order, much more independence, belief in the self, uh, distrust of institutions. Uh, over in the UK, I'll give you an example. Um, we don't, younger people are really demonstrating they have less trust in, in Parliament and the forces of democracy. We see fewer and fewer people engaged 
in the part in, the, in the elections and decision making within existing institutions. And really, this is associated too with a whole dynamic world, in a, a world of jobs, of social life, of lives in general. And in a sense, what we can see here is a whole load of tugs of war going on. Uh, I was discussing this with a market researching friend, and uh, after we got through about five cups of coffee, he said, this is all, it's a load of polarities, isn't it? It's it tugs of war in all directions. On the one hand, we've got groups of young people saying that they're very altruistic, that they're interested in the environment uh, and in, in global climate changes, and animals, uh, animals and, and so on and so forth. On the other hand, do they actually do anything about it? And the Body Shop did some research some uh, ten years ago, and they found just this. Loads of people were interested in shopping at the Body Shop uh, and agreed with their social agenda and their environmental agenda, uh, and they're very supportive environmental um, uh, conservation. Then when Body Shop asked them, would you do anything about it, some, the, the numbers who'd actually be involved in it disappeared by some 70 or 80 percent. Uh, and in a sense, there's a sort of meanness. There are lots of, a lot of uh, young people who, who aren't really engaged with any of those things at all and really draw back in on themselves. Me, the individual, is it. We've heard all about, from, from Bijou, this whole idea of career new careers and different types of careers. And on the right-hand side, we could think of life as a linear existence. We go through school, we go through college, we're looking for a good job, we're looking for a profession, we progress onwards and upwards. But there's another group of young people who are really looking at life as a, a portfolio. I'll give you an example on this as well, a little story. Um, a few days ago, while I was planning this uh, trip, I was talking to a colleague just before the start of term about her teenage daughter, and we we were swapping sort of teenager-type notes. Uh, and she was saying she was doing very well at school, her daughter. Uh, she was wondering what to do when she was doing her, her what to do with her, her school leaving certificate for A-levels. And her daughter, coming along so well, she's of the opinion that she might just as well stop at that point, might go on to university, might not travel the world, get some additional experiences, work here, work in India maybe, go and do some things she needs to do, take up some part-time jobs, then come back to the UK. She's got a whole wealth of experience. She's got her A-levels. Why not pick up university at that point, having made some further decisions about what she wants to do with her life, and also bring all sorts of things to a to new and perhaps an entrepreneurial career, which she knows is always going to be a portfolio of different activities. She might only do a job for two or three years, then she might go travelling again and pick up some new ideas or develop herself in different ways. And her life could spread out like that. So it's a different attitude. We've got individuals and the whole sense of me, I want to be me as myself, but a whole sense of wanting to belong as well. These, these younger people really want to be part of a group, uh, and that's the, that's the power and the offer of the brand. They want to be secure, and we'll come back to this in a second, but they want a load of freedom. And they're very knowing, and they think they know it all from, from all the knowledge and then from the information they've achieved, access, but they also think they're exploited by the, the large brands, by corporations, and so on. It's a real paradoxical world, isn't it? Let's first move further, a little bit further on before we see what the implications are for brands and for, for, for media communications. As in, the, as in the spending world, where does it all go? And, uh, we've seen all sorts of um, very similar descriptions from Bijou earlier on. Lots of money going to clothing. Personal care has come on very strongly in the UK. Eating out, of course. Themed restaurants have been very popular. Fast food restaurants. Pubs. Actually, pubs are declining as a, as a youth a point to, of um, youth uh, measure time in the UK. Uh, cinema, musical and electrical uh, activities, musical events, the, um, concerts, and entertainment of all sorts, uh, and food as well. And in fact, when we look at the, the spending, 15 to 24-year-olds from, from verdict, uh, the average uh, 15 to 24-year-old spends £3,471 a year. Uh, we have to guess a little bit out of this that food and grocery spending is pretty high. That's going to be in the slightly older age group. But a lot goes into clothing, a lot goes into personal care, £187 pounds into, into personal care. And if we, if we uh, join together music and electricals, i.e. buying CD players, PDAs, mobiles and so on, uh, you can see that those are really key, key spends and significant amounts being spent uh, per head per year. Very quickly then, what are the brand implications? Now I'll move on to the marketing, marketing communication implications. 
Uh, well, we've got all sorts of insecurities around here, and so there's going to be something about branding to younger people being engaged in offering a secure place. And it's going to be an authoritative place as well. And it's going to supply some level of trust when everything else around can't be trusted anymore. We've got a lot of images, and what's the substance behind it? Where's the stability in it all, which, as we see, is part of this paradox for the younger generation? And above all, we're going to have to engage with the individual. And so here are the sort of brand rocks, if you like. You've got to ask yourself, what does the brand stand for? It's got to meet up with these, these ideas of integrity and certainly authenticity, the real thing. And it's just a shame, really, that sort of Coca-Cola is slightly on the down at the moment, because there was a real thing for many years. It's got to certainly be outstanding against the competition, because there's a hell of a lot of competition out there. And it's got to be consistent, otherwise that integrity and authenticity, authenticity won't be projected. I think it's really, easy, uh, really useful to look at some findings from Ian Grant at a conference earlier this year. And he did some research into uh, what marketing agencies actually uh, did with their younger audiences. And he defined four stances, four approaches marketing agencies take. Number one is a brand as navigator. And this is the sort of Nike style where the brand is really going to lead the younger person in the sense of defining its lifestyle. It really takes a fashion follower point of view. It's going to have a power to actually lead the, the younger person onwards, define their lifestyle. Brand as weaver is a quite different sort of thing. Brands here are really being designed as sort of stealth brands. They're being woven in to internet or they're woven into films or they're being woven into other forms of communication so that in this sense, this stance understands young people as being very cynical and very knowledgeable. And if you're too heavy with your message, they're going to reject it. So you've got to be much more subtle. Number three, three is brand as host, and this style is much more engaging. So the marketing agencies here were taking a stance which said, we're going to engage you. You're part of what we're doing. Uh, and they're going to invite you in and be part of the development of it. So inviting you to join the chat line, to inviting you to subscribe to the radio show or whatever it is. The brand as host, you come and engage, you come and do the experiential thing, which experience the brand or the product, uh, try it out, try this brand of beer out or whatever it is, and be part of it, leading you in. And finally, slightly more dubiously, I think um, brand is owned by the consumer. Here the, the consumer really is defining the brand. Um, and I think Grant actually falls down a bit here because he can't actually find any examples. But we could think of situations where the consumer is so tied up in the brand that they are actually involved, actively engaged, in defining exactly what it is. So we're going to have to use all these things to make this happen. We're going to have to facilitate using technologies. We're going to have to be very flexible in this dynamic world. We're going to have to innovate as fast as we can. Above all, we're going to have to be interactive, and we're going to have to use information in the most accessible and most useful ways we can to, to let uh, younger people know all about our products and brands. Now, how is this all going to look? I think traditionally uh, communications models look, look like big sort of clusters like the last one. But what I'd like to say really, what I'd like to look at is a slightly different model based on interactivity. So over on the right hand side, we've got really very, the, mo the most interactive forms of communication. And over on the left hand side, we've got the more passive ones. And I'm not going to say too much really about so, billboards and posters. Um, first of all, they rely on, on sort of drive-by and many of the younger people don't have cars, so they're not really driving by. And these really work for younger people in places where they're out shopping or where they're out walking around and about at a leisure place, so in major shopping areas and major shopping streets. Um, and the only time they've really worked elsewhere is when they've been, in the UK, it's when they've been tied up, uh, for example, with Channel 4, which is a youth channel, um, uh, main time, well, has a youth orientation on, on, um, on television, and has been very successful in, in running shows like Friends, Sex in the City, and so on. Let's just move on and have a look at some of the implications. Some over -trend, overview of the trends here. Campaigns have increasingly become more multidimensional, but at the same time, creative campaigns have had to become uh, rather more short. And Sony PlayStation, having increased its expenditure in three years by 100% from 1 million to 3 million, is finding that it's had to work even harder to grab the younger people's attention. 
We're into a world of permission marketing, so mass marketing has disappeared, or is disappearing rapidly. Uh, we're into asking people whether we can actually communicate with them or not. We've got to engage with them enough to get them to correspond with us. And it might be that we don't actually need to advertise at all, because over in the States, a company called Jones Soda Company uh, launched into a very competitive carbonated drinks market <coughs> with hardly any advertising at all. It found a distribution point where it wanted to be. So surf clubs out on the beach, people where people at cinemas, leisure centres. It put the point of distribution out there and it slowly built up its image and so on from that point onwards. An internet site, if we were internet connected, we could go over there and look at it, uh, has become a really key aspect of, of, their, of their launch. So let's just look at some major trends in the whole, uh, in, in the communications process through these various uh, media. Well, I think over in the UK, one of the major problems is that we're actually losing contact with the youth market. So coverage of 16 to 24-year-olds uh, was down 17.2% in 2003. And so in a sense, where does TV really fit in? It still some, in some ways provides a social glue, particularly to the younger age groups. So you're watching friend, programs like Friends, or you're watching programs uh, like, particularly for the younger ones, like Simpsons, which is uh, the number one TV show in, in for, ch for younger age groups in the UK. And part of the problem is we're into a multi-channel world of MTV, many Sky channels, many cable channels. It's very difficult to find the niche now. And of course we've got a PVR, a personal video recording threat to advertising too. As in, as in radio, we've got plenty of music out there, so there are a huge number of niche opportunities. And also we've got to recognize the technologies for changing fast. So in the UK we've seen a huge uptake in digital radio, providing better signals and better stations. And, and we've got to think about it transforming itself into an online medium as well, and the implications for advertising there. Cinema remains a really uh, successful and popular uh, route to reach younger people. And you can see here that uh, there are a huge number of 15 to 19 year olds who are out uh, going to the cinema once every month, 40% or so go out and enjoy a film. And they're not too fussy about what they watch. This is the entertainment aspect, a uh, um, leisure, uh, leisure lifestyle aspect of today's youth. They're going out there to have a sociable time, a leisure time. They're not too worried about what they watch unlike us oldies, who are a bit more uh, picky about what we go and see. Internet, we've talked about uh, a little bit, and we've heard some very very good points earlier on, but strong growth here. We've expected uh, at least to be double digits in terms of advertising growth. And where is this happening? Well, there are all sorts of aspects, aren't there? Chat rooms, a very key area to infiltrate, but back to stealth marketing. Uh, there's a world of creating avatars, that's artificial characters, virtual characters, virtual personalities. Um, research shows that Chinese uh, teenagers have at least three alternative personalities they've created for themselves. Back to the world of being sort of, I'm a man united person one minute, I'm, I'm a, um, I'm a you know, sort of David Beckham fan or a, 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 a sort of pop stars fan next. And we have the whole world of, of downloads. And it's a measurable world as well. We can measure eyeball, contact, uh, and access to price comparison. Again, earlier today, we've heard all about mobile marketing, but this in the, in the UK has become a really hot topic. Um, it's the ultimate expression of individualism, according to one marketer. And interestingly, it's been particularly strong in the 25 to 34 age group, so not really in the, the very youngest age group. And it's working very well in terms of these, these aspects. Texting, even at the moment, very high awareness, recall of message is very good, positive effects for the brand have been shown to be excellent as well. And the cost per response has been very successful. So in that respect, we've seen lots of uh, developments. Uh, and one of the figures we can quote here is around about 5 euros, 5.73 euros, 5.73 euros, spent per month on, on uh, data downloads. That's music or, or messages. And uh, another, another, another detail here on um, ringtones. Uh, recent research has shown that uh, on average, a mobile phone user downloads a ringtone uh, twice a month. And if the ringtone costs between one and four pounds, and you multiply that by all the, all the mobile phone users in the world, it's a hell of a business. And of course, we've got all sorts of time possibilities, the internet, uh, replies, calls, 
the key thing here is to, to look at the whole uh, cost basis uh, and the futures for micro-marketing micro and segmentation. Well, we've just got a few other aspects to look at, and I think peer-to-peer -peer is a really critical one. This is, this is where younger people, particularly the, the teenagers and teenagers, are, are really engaging uh, with each other. When I asked my daughters, the, the in-house uh, consulting <coughs> department, where they learnt about new things, invariably they said, even when I prompted them, they said it was going around and playing at someone else's house. And someone else had got the iPod, and someone else had got the new jersey or jacket, the new trainers, the new book, whatever it was, the new record, the new CD. And so they're very receptive to peer-led information. And we can consider this in terms of face-to-face -face information or virtual contact through the internet, these chat rooms again. And it's important to think too of some very recent research by NOP World into the idea of reaching trend spreaders and, uh, by, by influentials. They, they said that a number of children are, are out there as influentials and they're very good at creating this, this, this spread of trend uh, and leading the crowd. Peer marketing then needs to identify and map behaviour. Uh, and a very good site to visit on this one on the internet is Billabong, the, the Australian surfing brand. Really engaged, you can see over on the right hand side, for example, of film festivals, uh, with all sorts of photographic competitions, surfing competitions, all sorts of things. The word gets around uh, that Billabong is a place to be. Street teams are out there, cool hunters are out on the street looking for the latest, <coughs> latest brand, and it's spreading by uh, peer uh, vote, peer pressure. And finally, we've got an all-time success with the, the Blair Witch Project, which is a film of a couple of years ago, uh, and the success it had with viral marketing by putting up what was almost a spoof website uh, and creating all sorts of interest long before the film actually came out. Um, and people going around saying, well, did it actually happen? The, the, the history, the background of this film was created in such a realistic way that it gave the impression that it was, a, it was actually a factual and a very sort of alarmingly exciting, thrilling, sort of factual activity event. On the slide with different types of media, I put a rather enigmatic one up, which is to do with environmental engagement. And it was really a coverall to, to, to gather in the idea of promotional activity in, in social environments. Because at first I was going to put in stores or point of purchase or point of sale, but it's much bigger than that. If we're going to get really close up to people, make it really interactive, what's going to be more interactive than getting up to them when they're out there enjoying their leisure time, when they're out in restaurants and stores, even schools and colleges and cinemas and clubs. So it's a much bigger thing than just being out in a shop. And we can consider all sorts of things. Exhibitions and events uh, can work for a very large number of brands, so that's sponsorship for those sorts of things. Uh, packaging, point of sale, even store design and obvious. Where's the product going to go in the store? Can we design, for example, with personal care products, where the cosmetics area is going to be for younger teenagers or for uh, younger people in general? Lastly, I'm just going to highlight one or two sort of areas which seem to be slightly on the down for young people um, over in the UK. Uh, magazines, for example, seem to be a declining medium. Yet, they're still really important sources of information for females. Over on the right hand side we see Cosmo Girls and Smash Hits. These really draw in uh, advertising and editorials, all sorts of information about celebrities. And the girls in particular are looking at the images to get new ideas about the latest trends, latest ideas. Uh, and the boys are out there reading special mag specialist magazines. The whole thing requires really careful appraisal of age and lifestyle positioning. And really I've sort of again, sort of grouped under a sort of general PR heading, this use of a celebrity endorsement. A really key motivator for purchase amongst females, and we see all sorts of pop stars and models, uh, David Beckham as a brand, is he or isn't he? Uh, idols turned into branded products. So Justin Timberlake online, he's in the process of being turned into a branded product with all sorts of spin-offs in terms of not just his music, but clothing and events and meetings and so on. And sponsorship, likewise, can work with different uh, younger brands as well. So Billabong and these other sporting brands like Quicksilver, you can see on the right-hand side, extreme sports become very interesting um, and very, very much um, defined by the niches they're in. Uh, as we've seen very much earlier on, uh, music continues to be extremely important as a medium to reach younger people. Well, I'm going to end at this point 
um, on an even more I think most matters note. Because having said we're living in a world that's dynamic and ever-changing, it does seem to be, though, that some things don't actually change. And this quote here is from a book from a study that was written in 1965. And in a sense, what has actually changed? Here they are, teenagers' behaviour is economic. They spend a lot of money on clothes, records, concerts, makeup, magazines, all the things that give immediate pleasure and little lasting use. And in that sense, what's really changed? 